Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Oh, shiny head. Uh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach, are we recording now? We're going to start yes. BS and start going. All right, man. So, Bobby, you are, you're are you out you're in Thailand. I'm in Bangkok, Thailand. It's 8 a.m. here. So, if I sound sleepy, that's because I just woke up. Oh, okay. Well, that's fine. We, 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 we've, done, we've already had two podcasts today and some other stuff. I just got done working out. Hey, uh, cool. where are you from originally? I mean, you're, I, I assume you didn't grow up. Maybe you grew up in Thailand. I don't know. Where are you from originally? Now, originally, I'm from Macedonia. There's a small country in the uh-huh. Balkans of Europe, next to Serbia, Greece. And uh, then I basically grew up in Germany. The last five years I've been traveling the world though, and that explains my accent, I would say. Yeah. I, I was actually born in Germany. I was born in Hof, Germany, which is on the, what's now the Czech Republic border down in Bavaria. Oh, nice. My dad was a military guy. I was born there when I was, you know, I, I didn't live there long, so I can't speak German a little sweet, bit. Sweet. But let me ask, you know, because this is interesting, because you are, you know, part of a, what seems to be a phenomenon of former you know, vegans that are now leaving veganism. And it seems like a deluge. It seems like there's quite a few that are just kind of abandoning ship. And I don't know if, uh, you know, someone did it and it inspired other people to do it, if that's what's going on, or if it's just that there's so many vegans now that this is just a natural uh, occurrence. And I want to talk about that. But let's, let's first, before we do that, Let's just talk a little bit about your experience because you know when I you know because I, I became aware of you I can't remember how I think I saw, I think I saw your critique of Garth Davis Dr mm-hmm. Davis and I, I, I watched it and I thought well, that's pretty cool and you know I, I kind of like what you had to say and I think I commented on that or something and then I looked at your Instagram and you know back when you were vegan you were I mean you were you're a fit guy I mean you look good you're right. muscular you're lean I mean I'm sure most people would point to you mm-hmm. as a role model for a vegan as a guy that look at this guy man he's got a lot of muscle he looks athletic that's he true. looks healthy so right. talk about Talk about your story a little bit. Just kind of give us your background, and, and then we'll get into some of the details, and then maybe talk about this phenomenon that seems to be going on. Sure, sure. Yeah, see, about the whole muscle building on a vegan diet, I started bodybuilding and powerlifting when I was 16 years old, right? And that is basically the better half of my, my life. Hence, when I was a vegan, I already had substantial amount of muscle through veganism, I went through fasting practices where I would lose a little bit of muscle and then regain that muscle again. And everybody that has been into weightlifting knows there is such a thing as a memory effect. So therefore, to this very day, I cannot say it was due to the vegan diet that I built muscle. I would rather say that despite the vegan diet, I still could keep some muscle, right? Because my heydays were when I was 19 or 20 years, basically 10 years ago, and I was much more muscular than I was ever as a vegan. So yeah, that is that. Other than that, as a vegan, I was basically yeah, buying into this philosophy of low protein, such as promoted by Garth Davis, that you do not yeah. eat that much, that essentially carbohydrates are our primary fuel source, and that is very protein sparing, that it has been propaganda right, sold to us by the meat and dairy industry. We need much, much less. And I thought, wow, I've been doing it wrong all my life, right? As a bodybuilder back in the day, I used to eat rice and chicken six times per day. So apparently I did it all wrong, right? The vegans came out with a new solution, eat 30 bananas instead. All right. So I might as well try it. eh? Yeah, I tried that out. And again, you know, if you increase certain measurements, you can keep some muscle. But to have real muscle growth on the vegan diet, I cannot say that this is really the case. And this is what I see with so many people promoting vegan bodybuilding now. Most of them build their muscle on meat like anybody else. Yeah. Did you, Bobby, were you using like vegan protein powders at all and stuff too? Like pea-based proteins and stuff? Or were you trying to do it like a whole food approach? <clears throat> yeah, I tried both. In the beginning, I got rid of all the supplements. So I tried it out the 
natural way, whatever that means. So I tried out with chickpeas and lentils and tofu and tempeh and all of that. But after a while, you just run into digestive issues. Essentially, on the vegan diet, this is an interesting thing. You cannot get the best of both worlds. Either you can feel somewhat all right, but then you need to eat little calories. If you want to perform on a higher level, then you will need more protein. And for that, you will need lentils, beans, and such, and that will compromise your digestion again. So therefore, after a while, you have to supplement with protein powders because you cannot eat those sheer amounts of plant protein. It's practically impossible. And therefore, yes, I was supplementing and essentially i got even sponsored in the end by a vegan supplement company for proteins what yeah. bobby let me ask you what when did you go vegan and what was the what made you decide to do that was it was it a, a it was it was an ethical compassion thing did mm. you want to do it for health because i mean apparently you were already in shape and already lean muscular dude mm. what 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 sort of led you down you know to, to make that decision Sure, sure. Yeah, Sean, see, when I was in Macedonia, my family, they're all hunters and butchers, all of them, right? And I saw my first pig getting slaughtered when I was two years old. And obviously, as a two-year-old, that was just a shocking scene. I couldn't stand the sight of it. To be honest, when I'm looking back nowadays, I think I was just exposed to such a thing way, way too early in life. I mean, let's be honest, if you're two years old and let's say you walk in onto your parents having sex in the bedroom, you will get traumatized, right? It's just too early. That doesn't mean sex is bad. And the same applies for hunting or slaughter or whatnot. It is just part of life that I was exposed to too early, I would say. Since then, I always felt very compassionate towards animals. I always had dogs, cats, and whatnot. I was always playing with animals. And yeah, then essentially through bodybuilding, I became so unconscious, if you will, about my food choice. I would go to the supermarket. I would buy the meat. There was no connection anymore. And I would totally overeat to a point where I felt disgusted by eating so much animal products out of the supermarket. Yeah, and then I started reading into the studies, and as I said, the vegans claimed that, hey, scientifically speaking, we essentially found out that eating meat is bad for you, and now you don't have to anymore. The whole thing seemed to be as if we overhauled the idea of eating meat. Like, that was something that we used to do back in the day. Now we have supplementation. Whatever you need can be synthesized. So therefore, we are living in this evolved society where we can replace everything. There is no need anymore. The vegans like to say, if we don't need to, why do it, right? And I said, okay, that makes sense. So therefore, initially, it was a compassionate move, but it was backed by science, or at least I thought so. Yeah. When, you know, and you did this for several years, I think, I, I think maybe you said four years or something like that. Was that right? Four years straight, no cheats whatsoever. 100% plants. And then, I mean, I mean, you have a YouTube channel. You had, I mean, assume a fairly large following. You had a lot of people that looked up to you that took your advice. I mean, I assume you were, you were committed to this and all in, uh, you know, and you were, you were saying what you believed at the time. Sure. Uh, as many of them, as many people, I'm sure do it. And I'm the same way. I, I, I say what I think is true and I may be wrong. And I, and in five years from now, I may change my mind, but I mean, I'm still going to mm. say what I think is true. At what yeah. point did you decide that it wasn't working for you? Because when I look back, mm. you know, I mean, I see pictures of you from two or three months ago and you you look healthy to me. It wasn't mm. like, you know, I mean, at least, you know, again, Instagram and social media, you put out your best, you know, you put out your best face so on and so yeah. forth. But at what point did you start to say, or what made, what made that decision for you? Was it a health decision? Was it just thought decision? Yeah. How did you decide to, to, to no longer want to want to practice veganism? Sure. Yeah. First I have to say, man, looks are not everything, right? Nobody knows how you feel inside. So you can look like Mr. Universe. If you feel shit inside, nobody sees that. Right. And for me, it basically started two years into veganism, but I have a very, very high pain threshold, I say, and I just ignored all the symptoms. I was just talking to a friend, and he told me that he saw veganism as a bad relationship, right? First, you have this honeymoon period where everything is fine, and then you cling on to it, and you try to save it, right? You try to really, really make it work again. And this is what I used to do for two years, because I got all the side effects in the book. I got the bad digestion, I got the depression, I got the anxiety, I got the paranoia, social anxiety, which is super weird for me because I was always a very social guy. I got tooth pain beyond belief. I lost the tooth. I had to go to the dentist three times per week here in Bangkok, root canal treatments and whatnot. 
Oh, it was terrible. Chronically inflamed, diarrhea for eight months. Yeah, those were basically all the symptoms that were kicking in. And I tried to fix them with every possible scenario. I was always blaming it on Bangkok. Maybe it is the water supply around here. Maybe the hygiene isn't tip top. Maybe this is why. I tried every single approach, the supplementation. I tried the fasting. I tried readjusting the diet again and again and again and again. And yeah, at some point, I couldn't take it any longer. I believe, and this is something that you said in the beginning, many people started speaking out about the same issues. And this is when I saw the patterns repeating because, I mean, you know it as well, Sean. Everybody that is coming out as an ex-vegan reports on basically the same side effects over and over again. It's the same story. In the beginning, they feel great. And then weakness, fatigue, tooth decay, and whatnot. It's always the same story. Yeah, and then I said, I cannot take it anymore. Bobby, when, you know, because you said you tried everything, you know, and, and this is where some people will cr criticize you because I hear that oh, sure. all the time. We see that, well, these vegans just know they were fasting or they were, they were doing detox, you know, they're, they're yeah. trying everything and no one, none of them are mm. doing the Dr. Grieger daily dozen or Dr. Garth <laughs> Davis's proteinaholic plan. None of them do that. It's mm. only these crazy young kids that... Sure that do all the stupid stuff. Those are the only ones that leave veganism. Now you are right. an intelligent guy. I mean, you're, you know, successfully building a, a, a good physique. Mm -hmm. So that takes some knowledge about nutrition and how to do sure. things. And so talk to me about, you know, your approach to veganism early on. What did, how did, did you decide? I mean, you weren't, you weren't out there drinking piss from day one, and, <laughs> and, you know, drinking turpentine. You know, I don't know what you're doing, but I mean, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, I assume, oh, thanks. I passed on that one. I passed on that vegan practice. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> you, I mean, I assume you went into it with, with knowledge and wanting to do it the best way you could right. balancing the nutrition. Talk to me about how that went and the things you tried and, and that whole sort of, we'll get into that later. We'll get into how the sure. criticism comes, comes down later. Sure. Yeah, see, first I have to say that those people that go through those fasting practices and such, people have to take into consideration those people didn't just start with drinking piss, right? Yesterday they ate a steak and today I'm going to drink piss. This is it, right? They get into veganism and out of a sudden they feel bad and they try to adjust their diets. It's not because they feel so great on the vegan diet. This is something that people really have to consider here. Anyways, for me it was like that as well. I went onto the whole food plant-based diet first. And then I start encountering the first issues, digestive upset, low energy and such. This is why I tried out water fasting, intermittent fasting. That is nothing radical, right? I tried the raw vegan approach, the fruit approach as well. I tried it out just to feel better again because I didn't feel good on the whole food diet. Anyways, after seeing that those approaches don't work either, I said, okay, now I'm going to do everything from a sport nutritional perspective. I'm a personal trainer myself. So I said, all right, all the micronutrients need to be adjusted. All the calories need to be adjusted. The macronutrients, the protein levels need to be at least at 2.5 grams per body weight, kilogram, carbohydrate for my activity level and such. So everything was accounted for and it still failed, right? The daily dozen, I did that for basically over a year. I was eating the berries, the flax seeds and all of that. And because there could be a potential danger of not essentially getting enough DHA and EPA. I said, all right, cool. I'm going to supplement the LGL. I'm going to supplement the B12, the D3, everything, right? Iodine and whatnot. Everything was accounted for. I was tracking everything religiously and I still failed. So therefore, you know, when people come out and they blame me, I haven't done it right. It's just their default. They're like little bots that will just repeat that sentence. You didn't do it right. You've never been vegan. Yeah, I heard it all before, but I'm very, very confident that I did it right. Thanks a lot. So, hmm. so Bobby, like you have an interesting story and I, I, I love having guests like you on the show. And one thing I try to do is to try to think like, what would I do in that, in the situation, how I would think maybe if I were in the same situation you are. And, um, you know, you know, I can appreciate a potential that there's a very tiny sliver of the human population that can somehow just do well on a vegan diet, a strict vegan diet. But your experience would tell that you weren't one of them at the very least. Do you think that that's kind of a, that's the, the, the reality? Or do you think that there's nobody who can survive on a vegan diet? And these people are pulling the hood over our eyes with uh, this like 15, 20, 30 year vegan type stuff. Mm, yeah, that is a great question. Honestly, there was a time when I thought that there might be a small population that can thrive on plants only. Nowadays, 
honestly, after being deeply, deeply embedded in the vegan community, I can tell you firsthand that there are so many vegan YouTubers, huge names that will come out very, very soon and say that they've been either cheating on their vegan diet or that they felt like shit all along. The human psychology is amazing. People go through denial for years and years on end or as I said, they're cheating and they're lying to the audience for money. So therefore, as for right now, even people that are claiming that they feel good after the reintroduction of animal products, I see an improvement in every single one of them. I have dear friends around here that used to be vegan. When I made the switch, they said, you know what? All right, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to try it out myself. They tried it out and they felt great as a vegan before that. All of a sudden they realized, shit, man, I didn't even know how it feels to really feel good. If you're sick and you don't know it, you don't even know how it feels to be really healthy. So yeah, I don't believe anybody really thrives. Yeah. And we, that, that topic comes up a lot on the podcast too, this idea of like normalizing feeling bad. And I think, mm. uh, the, you know, I think that's a reality for a lot of folks, not necessarily the vegans with folks over here following a standard American diet, you know, they've normalized sure. feeling like garbage. So they think, you know, well, this is just the way things are supposed to be. And then when they turn and look at their friend or their family members and they feel the same way, look the same way, they're like, well, that's just normal. In reality, they've just never optimized. And, um, yeah, 100%. I mean, it is absolutely accepted to feel shit nowadays. In nowadays society, it is the default, right? To feel weak, to underperform, that somehow became totally normalized. But as I said, once you reintroduce those things as a vegan, I have yet to meet anybody that tells me they didn't feel a difference. So therefore, yeah, absolutely just confirming their own biases and not knowing how it truly feels to perform on a good level. This is why I have to say I'm very grateful that I came from a sports perspective, from a background where I already used to know how it feels to perform good. When I was in the gym, the later years, man, of veganism, I was suffering. I was depressed in the gym. I couldn't move the dumbbells anymore. I was thinking about doing yoga instead, right? And this is where you see people naturally getting drawn to. They're malnourished, and then the next thing you know, you're the vegan yoga trainer, right? And it feels natural to you just because you're not capable to move weights anymore. It's really the case. Let me, let me, but let me just ask you, because I, I see this all the time. We, we see, uh, you know, they'll point to guys like Nemo Delgado and John Venus and Patrick Baboumian and uh, Kendrick Ferris and, and, and Tim Sheaf, who's now no longer a vegan. And actually, I think Tim's coming on the show as well. But we see those guys. And when I look at a guy like Kendrick Ferris, and yes, he went to the Olympics, but he had his worst performance ever. And then he got hurt and he's basically out since. And so comment on the fact that we, we, we have these people, they uphold these athletes that are doing well, Serena Williams. And saying these guys are on veganism, you're crazy. They can do great. What do you? How do you counter that? Because I, 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 I say these people are genetically gifted, and they're they're still not reaching their potential. I see a lot of guys in the NFL at the highest level eating garbage. I mean, eating a junk food diet. And sure. so I think I think there's such a human difference in genetic potential that we see this, and I I just don't think they're hitting their optimum. Um, when they talk about Patrick Baboumi being the strongest man in the world, I'm like, he's nowhere even close. I mean, I know the guys. I mean, I just talked, we just said Stan Eppening on the show, and he mm -hmm. feeds uh, Thor Bjornsson, you know, half Thor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw yeah. six pounds of red meat a day. And those guys, are, <laughs> those guys are the strongest men in the world. So let me, let, let, what is your response to these, these, these you know, Nemo Delgado, I'll never eat meat. I'm, I'm, I've never touched meat in my life. What, what do you sure. think to that? Yeah, Nima Delgado, let's just start with him first because it's such a great example of, yeah, the vegan bodybuilder, the IFBB pro. Okay, vegan or not vegan, that is the true question here because all of his muscle has been built on a vegetarian diet, right? If you're vegetarian, this is just a fact. He was vegetarian until six weeks prior to his first show. That is admitted. So all of his muscle has been built vegetarian. I'm not saying vegetarian is ideal, but at least you will get certain nutrients, right? At least you will get some cholesterol. You will get some quality protein. Whey protein, eggs, and dairy, that was his go-to. Then he did this cut, his definition phase, for six weeks, vegan, and he placed all right at his first show. Since then, we haven't seen any contest pictures of him anymore. He competed, and he didn't show any of those competition pictures on his Instagram. What went wrong? That was one year after veganism, right? Now, two or two and a half years in, he doesn't post anything. All of those pictures are old pictures. Therefore, most of those athletes, again, they build their careers on meat. 
then they make the switch and they get praised by the vegan community. There he is, the world's strongest man, vegan, right? He's been vegan for a couple of years. Since then, injury after injury, this is something that I forgot to mention. I got injured thousands of times. And the main difference is it is normal, quote unquote, to get injured as an athlete. It happens. But the main difference between meat-based and plant-based athletes is that the plant-based athletes do not recover. Their careers turn to shit. And this is what you see with all of those vegan athletes as well. Patrick Baboumian too. He had to end his career because of injuries. That's pretty much what is going on here. Meat-based in the beginning, then injury, end the career. This is the always repeating pattern that you see with those vegan athletes over and over. What was the, uh, let me ask you this question. So, you know, there's an ethical, obviously there's a large ethical part of the vegan uh, sure. ideology, uh, to, to lack of a different word. And how do you, I mean, because I assume that you, you know, you at some point participated and believed that, that, you know, I don't want to say meat is murder and all that stuff that you constantly, how do you now sort of reconcile changing your mind about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. It was hard in the beginning. I'm not going to lie. After four years of veganism, man, it was tough, really. I started out with eggs and eating eggs felt like I was catapulted back in a time machine or something. I felt like a caveman, right? <laughs> and then I progressed into fish and such. The ethical issue was tough, but there was one factor that I was already thinking about three months prior to leaving veganism. And I just saw that nobody has the moral high ground because for modern day food production, if you look into plant production, there's so much buy kill. It's much more than if you would eat one cow per year or whatever. So hence, when I saw that, I realized, wait a second. In life, there will always be a certain amount of suffering. Something will die, nevertheless, right? And if we as humans close our eyes to our food and want to distance ourselves, from our food, then, all right, we can rely on to those big companies. We're going to get our quinoa shipped across the country in plastic bag, put it onto our table, eat it, and feel righteous about it. Meanwhile, millions and billions of animals have been killed in the crop production. And therefore, I said to myself, okay, if I want to be happily oblivious here and act as if I'm on the moral high ground, I can, but that is just absolutely ignorant. In the beginning, when I found about veganism, I found out about what is going on in the meat production, in the industry. So when I found out about that factor, I couldn't ignore that either. And then I realized, okay, as a vegan, you're not more ethical. It's actually a lie. You're much more ethical if you reduce your grain consumption and you eat a more meat-based diet. So therefore, the ethics, yes, I do not like to see animals suffering, but animals will suffer for modern day food production nevertheless. Yeah, and Bobby, that's also like one of the things that I always find interesting because I, I feel like most conscious carnivores or omnivores would be very open to a conversation of let's give these animals a very high quality of life and at the end of their life, we'll, we'll eventually eat them and then we can guarantee they have a long fulfilling life as opposed to what they're going to see in the wild where what is like half a ruminants get mm -hmm. killed before the age of one. Um, you know, and, and then kind of make it, you know, that, that's where I think the, 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 the feeling good of the whole situation would kind of fall. But mm -hmm. instead, we end up getting in these arguments about, you know, kill or not kill. It's like black and white when in reality, like you said, if you just peel back one more layer of that onion, you find out, oh, I'm killing no matter what I do just to be alive. So minus ending my own life, I'm going to mm -hmm. be killing stuff in order to stay alive. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, Bobby, I think, you know, from an ethical standpoint, you know, I'm, I'm just putting myself in the shoes as, as a vegan that's thinking about maybe leaving. And I think, you know, while it's true in the United States, most of our animals are fed grain and, and the, the grain that we produce also involves killing little animals. And, and, and I know you're aware of sure. that, but if you make the ethical decision that I'm going to eat just an animal that was raised on grass, there's very little by kill in that, in that particular process. They're generally just that animal you eat. And, and, and in the end, you're actually causing less death to animals by choosing that route. You know, if you're a vegan, you say, I'm going to no longer be a vegan, but I'm going to eat only grass finished animals that are well pastured. Now, yeah. you know, again, Zach's point of the argument, yes, they're still dying and they're not living out their natural lifespan, but neither are all these field mice and rabbits and deers and foxes and whatever else and insects, if you count insects as sentient, uh, neither are they. And so exactly. I mean, that, to me, that's, that, that's a pretty solid argument to make. 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't want to get too woo here and spiritual, but even the Buddha realized back in the day, life is suffering. And I see in this world that we are growing up, we are so disconnected from our food supply, and we start to live in this utopia where nobody dies. But you have to understand that there is a life cycle for everything. And as you said already, Zach, in nature, those animals would die before they are one year old as well. They would get torn apart in the most vicious way imaginable. Right. So therefore, with animal husbandry, we're offering them a safe zone where they can live out their life until we, of course, decide to eat them. But that is a symbiotic relationship and the death will come nevertheless. Again, if you try to escape that direct kill, yeah, you produce millions and billions of other deaths in the food processing of crops and grains. So what is the better option here? Yeah, my, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I heard something in the long line you were going to look at doing something to sort of document or do some kind of documentary sure. based around this concept. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. As for right now, I'm in contact with one producer in particular, food producer from Australia, Rob Tungs. And he is a food producer for animal foods and for plant foods. And he has absolutely no interest in bashing either or or glorifying either or. He just came out and said, listen, I produce plants and animals, but the vegetarian dish always kills more animals than the lamb that I had yesterday for dinner. That is just a fact. And hence, we're going to go through Australia and expose what is going on in plant production because I cannot hear it anymore. This moral high ground, this high horse of vegans coming and telling me now that I'm so unethical just because they're sitting here oblivious and munching on their chia seeds. I was in Koh Phangan. It's a small island here in Thailand. And this is where the shift happened. It was this vegan restaurant and I ordered this vegan burger made out of quinoa, chia seeds, hemp seeds and whatnot shipped across the country right from South America to this little island here in Thailand. Meanwhile, there was this little fisherman right next to it, caught the fish, that morning is selling it right there. How much better does it get in terms of environmental footprint? And I thought, dude, I'm a hypocrite. This guy is selling his fish right here on the island, right? And I'm buying stuff that has been shipped all over the globe. And I'm acting as if I'm somehow morally superior to those people it doesn't make any sense and therefore yeah we want to expose what is going on in the plant production and do a documentary about that bobby why do you why do you want to do this i mean what is compelling you to want to continue to you know influence people i mean you know i, I suspect i know why but I'd, I'd like to hear from you like why why do this why not just you know fade off and go back and do whatever and, and not not deal with this stuff i mean do you feel compelled to help people from maybe making mistakes that you made or what, what's, what, why, why are you doing this? Sure. Yeah, Sean, see the thing is this, man. I saw it too often. People, they just go back to eating meat and they disappear from social media, right? But when you've been a vegan, you've been passionate about this subject, right? You thought it's the right way to go. You promoted it. And then you realized, hey, wait a second. Maybe your health failed. Maybe your friend's health failed. I see it over and over and over again. Young people are stepping into veganism and they're compromising their health. It's such a destructive diet. As I said in the beginning, as for right now, I still have to see one person that is truly thriving on this diet. So we can go into conspiracies behind it or whatnot. The reality of things is, as for right now, people are suffering and people need to speak out about it. As you see, now that we have the support system here where people share their experiences, People see, hey, I'm not alone in this, right? There are other people that suffer as well. It's not only me, right? It's not only me. It is essentially the diet's fault. But this is the first time that this is a possibility. So therefore, I will speak out for the people. And as for right now, I have to say this as well. When I was a vegan, people would send me messages and send comments. And they would tell me, Bobby, you turned me vegan. Thank you very much. But nothing would ever follow up. Right, that's it. Like, thanks, you made me vegan. Done. <laughs> what happened next? Nothing, right? Nowadays, people tell me, Bobby, thank God, man. I was listening to your videos and I thought you're full of shit. But I made the switch myself and I feel amazing, right? My libido is back. My energy is back. My health returned. My teeth feel good again. So on and so forth. I get messages on a daily basis. So therefore, I see there is a need for disclosure. The vegan propaganda machine 
become stronger and stronger on a daily basis. As I said before on the Garth Davis video, there is so much conflicting science that is based upon plant-based studies. And I'm saying nothing wrong with eating plant-based if you choose so. But those studies are not made on vegan populations. And therefore, you cannot promote a vegan diet that excludes all the animal products under the falsehood of a plant-based diet. It is a dangerous ideology, and I'm going to speak out against it. Yeah, so you're, I mean, essentially making the distinction between vegetarianism and veganism, you know, which, which is more 100%. of a, you know, which is a ethical, I mean, I always hear that veganism is not a diet, it's a, it's a belief system, um, you know, and, and you know, we always hear you're not really a vegan if you ever leave. I guess the only way to leave is when you die, I suppose. I mean, it has to be on your tombstone to be a real vegan. You have to die for the cause, yes. That's, that's the only right. way you can do it, I guess. But um, what, so talk about this because, you know, and, and not to be conspiratorial, but I do see mm. a, a very, it seems like a concerted effort to really impact young people, to go after mm. these kids that are mm. impressionable, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're even in grade school, they're, they're seven, eight, nine years old, even sometimes. And, and, and we're course. seeing that uh, going on. Uh, do you see any problem with that? I mean, people will say, well, you know, these kids are, you know, they're exposed to meat and, and told meat is good for you. And that's bad, too. And so that's the counter argument. Mm -hmm. But what, what is your concern about, you know, you know, going in and, and doing vegan activism and, and, and sure. particularly recruiting young kids? Yeah, so first of all, meat is bad too. How so? Without eating meat, we wouldn't be here right now, right? So every single generation has been eating meat. So therefore, that has to be proven as bad and convince the masses that this is bad. Up until now, I don't see any evidence for meat being bad, right? That is first and foremost. Secondly, in Germany, we have the first vegan kindergartens now, right? They opened up vegan kindergartens where parents can support each other and tell each other that it's so good to feed their kids grains and soy. Fantastic job, Germany. Good. And yeah, what do I think about it? Yeah, obviously, it is absolutely terrible. We see this push and I see it happening already for the last oh, 30 years or so. It happened with cornflakes for breakfast, right? Breakfast cereal and such. That is already all plant-based foods. You know, you have to think about it like this. When you look into food production, people nowadays, the vegans, they will say, cut out the middleman, go straight to the source. Where do those animals get their protein from, right? Go to the plants. Okay, vegans, think about this. Those cows, originally, they're not eating soy and corn, right? They're eating grass. You cannot eat grass. You cannot convert it. So therefore, now they tell you, yeah, but those cows, they eat the crops. They eat the soy and the corn. Now, if we cut out the cow, you can eat the soy and the corn. Yeah, great job. That soy and that corn is not meant for the consumption of that cow to begin with. And now you're going to eat it. It's unhealthy in both cases. So therefore, again, to not get too conspiratorial, let's just talk about an economical standpoint. It's easier to feed you all of that grain. It's simple. It makes more money in the end. It's easier. It's more effective. Yeah, and obviously they want to reach out to the children because they're the most gullible, right? And the children, as I said before, you get traumatized with anything if you're not old enough for it. They will show you Disney movies, and then they will tell you how bad it is to eat meat. And you, as a kid especially, will say, wow, how amazing. I never need to grow up, right? I can live in this fairy tale land. I can stay in the Neverland Ranch, whatever, and eat cornflakes and grains and never need to kill. Of course, those kids are the most gullible. Of course, it's being catered to them. And this is the dangerous thing because I've been in contact with many, many social media influencers and those kids are in their 20s, right? They are just bought and paid for. They are basing their online income on those companies, the plant-based companies that are sponsoring them, starting with plant-based news. Going, I'm not going to expose any other names. Those people are sponsoring those young kids and using them for their agenda. Those kids do not know what they got themselves into. It's absolutely horrible, destructive practice. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's, uh, you know, I'm not surprised. I mean, there's a lot of made, money to be made in, you know, in what I think is processed food, quite honestly. I think there's just a lot of money out there. But why do you think, I mean, what do you, I mean, I, I hear all kinds of conspiracies. Believe me, I, I, I as, a, as a crazy carnivore guy, I get a lot of people that are out there, believe me, and I, and I see these things. And, you know, 
you know, why, why is there a push at the very top levels? If, if we want to believe there's somebody, you know, mm-hmm. the, the chief from Saudi Arabia that funds plant-based news, why does mm-hmm. he want to do that? What is, what's motivating him to want to make everybody, you know, eat soy and, and, you know, corn? What, what's going on with that? Yeah, I mean, in the end, we have to admit that we do not know what is going on on the highest level, right? It's only an assumption in the end. So therefore, I wasn't at the coffee meeting with the Bilderberg group yesterday, right? <laughs> so I cannot really know what they're planning. But if you look into it, it's pretty, pretty sensical to see that if you look into nature, right? Wim Hof, the Iceman from the Netherlands, he said something very, very beautiful. He said, your mother wants the same that mother nature wants for you. And that is for you to be happy healthy and strong okay now if i look into the vegan diet happy nope you get sad and depressed healthy nope you get sick strong yeah obviously not quite the opposite you're getting weak right so therefore through food manipulation you essentially create a consumer that is reliant on your food and your medicine there is a good reason i'm from leverkusen germany that is the yeah, essentially the main, the main city of Bayer Industries, right? The pharmaceutical complex that just bought Monsanto. Of course, they have an interest to sell you their food and then sell you their medicine. It is an artificially created problem. If you eat that food, of course, you will run into issues. If you eat any processed food, you will run into issues long term. What people do not understand is that this vegan diet is a completely man-made manufactured diet. All of those plants, they think they're eating a whole foods diet. All of those plants have been man-made. If you look at a banana, a banana has no seeds. It is a clone. You would find nothing like it in nature. All of those whole foods are essentially already processed foods, right? The only whole food would be animal foods. That is just the case, but people do not want to see that. So you produce processed foods you make the masses sick and weak and then you offer a solution which is of course to be found in the pharmaceutical complex which is owned by the same people yeah that is basically how i see it yeah it's so you know it it seems like with all this stuff you can always follow the money and you're going to find the answer to a lot of the questions and even if you don't want to go as deep as you described uh, and you just have to look the profit margins of some of this stuff and it's you know it's why like the eat lancet study had so much of that advocacy they didn't have a lot of like you know your typical what you would consider i guess a whole food plant-based diet stuff in there they had a lot of processed grains and sugars and things like that in their recommendations because those are the things with the huge profit margins behind it so um it's it's not as profit making to you know raise a cow on grass and then take it to slaughter three or four years later exactly yeah, that's very true. I mean, if you look at the food pyramids and whatnot, I am still flabbergasted how you can recommend cornflakes as a food group or how you can recommend bread. Those were always cheat meals on my watch. I don't understand how that ended up as a food recommendation <laughs> by the government, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we actually had a Belinda Fecky on a few episodes ago, and, and she was explaining to us kind of just the, the basis of even the vegetarian diet here in America, and it was you know, essentially a, a movement from the Seventh-day Adventists. So it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, to call it an ideology isn't even, you know, a comparison. It, it literally <laughs> was an ideology. Yeah, of course. They have huge sa- shares in Sanitarium, right, which is a huge grain-producing factory as well. When I lived in Australia, the, what do you call those things, the cereals, wheat a bix or something on those lines, they were all produced by that very company, which is, is created by the Seventh-day Adventists. They have cereal companies so of course they're going to be interested in that uh, it's crazy yeah when i lived in new zealand i i, I remember eating some wheat bix you know yeah, yeah. It, t- it tasted like sawdust i don't know why people eat it, it <laughs> really good, you know me. but hey bobby let me ask you because you've been now uh, since you what when how long have you decided you know how, when was the point when you said i'm no longer vegan i'm gonna start introducing animal foods and diet and mm. talk to me a little bit about that process and what kind of changes you've, you've experienced over the last however long period of time oh wow Okay. Yeah. So that was three months ago. At that point, I remember that day clearly, man. I'm laying in bed. It was basically already two weeks or so that I had sex the last time with my girlfriend because of lack of libido. I can admit that with no shame. It was the vegan diet. It's not me. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, it was terrible, man. I had absolutely no desire for sex at all anymore. I remember having sex and just thinking about eating oatmeal because that was my only thing that I was still enjoying somewhat. Uh, even though now eating raw honey again, I realize I don't even like oatmeal. I like the raw honey on top of the oatmeal. Anyways, that's another story. So I was there sitting completely inflamed, my teeth hurting, nothing helps, severely depressed, suicidal thoughts even. And I'm just thinking to myself, all right, where is this going, right? So I was at ground zero. And when I reintroduced the animal products, you asked how and what improved. Yeah, basically everything, Sean. <laughs> It's crazy. You know, first I have to say, man, I never thought that I'm going to end up on your podcast out of all places because I remember being in pain, in agony, suffering and seeing the Joe Rogan experience with you on and listening to that podcast and saying, yeah, sure. He didn't even do blood work, right? Ridiculous. Yeah, great. Meanwhile, I did my blood work back in the day and my blood work turned out to be okay. But what did that mean? Nothing, man. I felt terrible. I felt horrible every single day. So what do those numbers really prove? Nothing. Anyway, so after the reintroduction of animal products, man, everything, everything improved little by little. The digestion improved. The diarrhea after eight months stopped straight away from one day to the other, right? Depression cleared up, teeth remineralized, no pain in my teeth. Oh, the strength of the gym is back again. The libido is back again. The desire for life, the joy is back. I just feel like a human again. I feel like myself again, finally, right? And basically, if you ask me what improved, what didn't improve, I feel like myself again, 100%. And one more thing, I just had to join the team Carnivore to get ready for this podcast, of course. So I've been on the Carnivore diet now <laughs> for the last, what is it? Four days by now, so still adapting somewhat. And I have to say, on the second day, I saw a humongous improvement in digestion again. So through the introduction of animal products, it already felt much, much better. But now for the first time, I just felt this ease, this relaxation. It felt like the butter was massaging my colon or something. It was absolutely amazing. And my sleep improvement since then is beyond belief. Yeah, so everything improved, really. There's nothing that didn't improve through the reintroduction. Well, we might have to title this podcast, The Buddha Was Massaging My Colon. <laughs> <laughs> hey folks, Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Hey, what, um, you know, and I, you know, I'm on YouTube now and you know, whatever, I never thought I'd get sucked into social media and, you know, you get sucked into some of the drama that's out there, but I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, I mean, there are people like, what is this freely the banana girl and vegan game? Oh, yeah. Are these guys, what's going on with those guys? Are they going to, are they going to dump veganism anytime soon? Or are they too bought into it or what, what, what's going on with those folks? If you want to speculate, I don't know if you, if you're willing to. Yeah, sure, sure. Why not? I mean, honestly, again, I know that basically many, many big YouTubers will come out as not being vegan anymore. But if we're talking specifically about Freely and Vegan Gains, uh, Freely will drop dead before ever dropping the vegan label. No chance for her to step out of that box. No chance in hell. I think she will just end up like, you have a few of those fruitarians, 20-year vegans and such, they look absolutely emaciated, lost all their teeth. I think she's going to end up there as well, unfortunately, because, I mean, there's so many people reaching out to her, trying to save her, but for her, meat is murder and will stay murder forever. I don't see her stepping out of that box ever again. Vegan Gaines, on the other hand, I still have hope for that guy because I see him really focusing on gaming nowadays. So maybe that will be a new outlet for him and he will reconsider his food choices. Yeah, in the end, man, everybody is responsible for themselves. All we can do is share the information and hopefully the people, the people will pick it up. Mm. Do you think, I mean, it seems like veganism is going to continue to expand and grow. I mean, do you see that happening? What are, you, what are your thoughts? I mean, you know, we hear a lot about it. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure because I, I'm not, con I don't know. I mean, it's, it, you know, when you listen to vegans, they're growing like wildfire and they're, they're, they're going everywhere. But when you look at the statistics, it's still remains a small percentage because a lot of people try it and then they leave it. 
What do you think is going to happen with that? But the, the, one of the issues is it's driving a lot of policy that may impact nutrition for people. And like you said, vegan kindergartens and schools where nutrition, they may alter the nutrition and, and, and also with national policy. So what do you think is going on with veganism over the next 10 years? Sean, it's an artificial push. That's what it is. In real life, there are not more vegans. It is absolute BS. There are not more vegans. The population of vegans in the UK increased to 5%. No, it's not true. No chance is that true. They are pushing their products everywhere. And as you said correctly, it is a political push because next thing you know, you're going to have the meat tax and such, right? And what they want to achieve in the end, it seems, is to have this narrative of meat is murder as the law, basically. That, of course, has vast implications, right? What will happen if you run over a cat on the street with your car? You're going to end up in jail or something. I don't know. And you see that this is essentially the narrative that they are pushing, but there is no basis in reality. Those products are in the shelf. They try to cater to everyone. They are promoting it. There is a good reason why you see those animal activists all of a sudden in the media all the time. Who has an interest in veganism? Nobody would have an interest in veganism if you wouldn't promote it. Who in his right mind would start thinking about excluding those food groups? Nobody. It is an artificially pushed movement, all of it. And therefore, the real numbers are much, much lower, I'm sure. Because even the real vegans are not even vegan, man. I know it for a fact. And even those vegan celebrities, the craziest thing for me was Jay-Z and Beyonce. They are offering a lifetime membership for their concerts, free concerts for the rest of your life if you go vegan. Why? Why do you have an interest in that? As if Jay-Z and Beyonce are vegan in the first place. What is the interest behind that, right? That should be a f the first red flag if you hear something on those lines. It is an artificially pushed movement with celebrities put in place to promote their agenda. There is nothing happening in reality. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, where, I mean, we see a lot of people, I guess, again, this is all this social media and celebrity stuff. And, and your, your sort of position is many of them are just pretending to be vegans, more or less. Or, or One, what do you, what 100 percent, 100 percent. But I know it for a fact. See, we just had a couple of people, I'm not going to name them, coming out recently, big YouTubers that are not vegan anymore. I've been in contact with those people. I know for a fact that they ditched the vegan label some time ago. And this is what is happening with many of those vegans, those social influencers, right? They are too attached to their label. They don't understand that they're spreading a dangerous misinformation here. Many people, they are sneaking in animal products, but in their mind, they're still vegan. Yeah, I just had a weak moment. No, you didn't have a weak moment. You're just following your cravings. This is your body reaching out to you to get in some nutrients that you cannot find in the plant kingdom. Those people are so deluded that they truly believe that they are vegan. Oh, yeah, I had some sushi last Sunday, oh, but I'm still vegan. No, you're not. You're not vegan. That is not veganism. This is a plant-based diet that you're following. And you're promoting a dangerous misbelief, which will lead to the exclusion, the abolition of those foods if it continues as such. Again, a bit too conspiratorial here, a bit too dark, but this is really where it's going. The next step, as you said already, could be the taxation first, and then in the end, the complete elimination of those food groups. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, what we see historically is as animal products go out, we've seen with animal fats, as we've seen a reduction in the usage of lard and butter, and that's been replaced with soybean oil, canola oil, margarine, and whatnot. Yes. We see when, when animal foods go out, the processed foods come back in. I think this is more of the same thing. And I don't, I, I'm not quite to the point where I think they're going to ban meat. They, make it, they may tax it. They may make it harder for people to get. They, they may not completely eliminate. But if they, can, if, they can get, if they can convince you to make meat a condiment, which is what we're hearing, meat needs to be a condiment, a little sliver on top of your grains mm. and salad and, and you know, whatever processed foods you want to eat, then they will, that will be a huge win for a windfall for these companies that make their make sure. the profit on that stuff and so i, I you but, know i i, I you know, i'm just it's, it's not going to happen overnight because there's just too many people that whose livelihoods depend on animal agriculture there's too many animals i mean it's not something that could happen even in 20 or 30 years in my view 
Yeah, it won't happen overnight, that is for sure. But see, once the lab-grown meat has been introduced, then you don't have an excuse anymore, right? If you look into the production of lab-grown meat, Memphis Meats is producing lab-grown meat. Tyson Foods already bought, I think, 70% of the shares or something. Either way, the FDA has already approved lab-grown meat from Memphis Meats. But let that sink in, yeah? It is already approved and we do not have a product yet. How do you know that this is suitable for human consumption without ever trying it? It's already FDA approved. So if that isn't something alarming, then I don't know what is. They're still working on their first beef patty, which should come out this year, they say. Let's see about it. And then it will be ready for the market. Man, that stuff could be cancer for all I know. It is lab-grown meat for the first time a human will ingest that in human evolution. And you have no second thoughts in it. So what I'm seeing here is once you reduce it, as you said, Sean, you reduced meat to a condiment. What stops you from eating lab-grown meat as a condiment, right? Why would you kill an animal if you, again, the vegan narrative, don't have to? If you do not have to, why would you, right? For a condiment, they're just going to produce a bit of lab-grown meat and people will be so used to this plant-based diet that they will happily eat it. This is what you see with people that are not in the carnivore movement, but simple omnivores. They are already embracing the lab-grown meat. Many people that I talk to from the fitness industry, they say, yeah, I don't want to hurt animals. Why not? Sounds like a good idea because we are so used to technology. And don't get me wrong, technology is amazing. Otherwise, we couldn't connect here. You're in the States. I'm in Thailand. We can talk. It's amazing. It's great. But when it comes down to food technology, we have to take into account that we're still in this animal flesh body. It is a monkey being in that sense. And that has specific dietary needs that didn't transcend yet. We're still not cyborgs, right? So therefore, yeah, I see the danger in the lab-grown meat specifically because I do not believe that people will become vegan by default, but they will eat lab-grown meat instead. And some people will be plant-based. Yeah, I mean, I think, and that's the same thing I see. I think a lot of people that you know, and I've looked quite in depth on how that process goes. And, you know, and, and then again, it's, there's evidence now that maybe it won't be as environmentally friendly. It'll put out more carbon dioxide and maybe methane isn't the issue. And I, I don't know if you get too much into the environmental issue because that's, you know, I think veganism, there's three pillars. There's a health pillar, there's an environmental pillar, and then there's an ethical pillar. And yeah. I think the health pillar is pretty easy. I mean, I can look in the mirror and, and I know I'm healthier or not. That's a pretty easy one to sort of debunk. Yeah. The ethical one really, that's hard because people's ethics, you know, that's, you, you, you know, it's, you're either going to do this or not, but then the environmental one is very difficult because mm. it's hard for me to look outside and at the sky and say, oh my gosh, the, the, you know, the, I, I can't see from my own eyes that the environment's getting better, getting worse. What's impacting yeah. that? What's not? Is it the fossil fuels? Is it the cars? Is it the cows? I have to rely on somebody that does a study to tell me these things. And so sure. how do you approach the environmental aspect or do you even talk about that anymore at the moment i'm mainly focused on the health aspect but about the environmental impact i mean really when did it become environmentally unfriendly to have ruminant animals grazing free sorry i don't see it so if you look into the desertification of the lands alan savory had a great ted talk about this as well i'm sure you heard about him you see that we essentially messed up the whole system that the Native Americans had in place. If you look at the bisons roaming free, that was the best practical food source that you could have, right? Huge ruminant animals. They give you so much meat. Absolutely amazing. What we did is we basically domesticated them, made cows out of them. Now you inject those cows with artificial hormones because they're too small. I'm asking myself, why don't you still eat bison instead? Anyways, so with the monocultures of those plants, we are doing so much environmental destruction. Hence, the question is, what is the lesser of those two evils? Is it really environmentally more friendly to create monoculture after monoculture and to create those crops for the masses? Again, I know that a lot of it is being fed to cows right now. Or would it be better to reintroduce ruminant animals? I do not see environmental issue with that scenario. Quite the opposite. I believe that this is the only way how we can make this planet green again, right? Yeah. Yeah, we had we actually had Alan Savory on the podcast, and actually his episode oh, nice. is, his episode is going to be released on Friday. Friday, this, I think. Those Great. Days. So I mean, he's our next one we're going to release. So yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's a very nuanced and difficult conversation, 
And, and it, 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 you, just like it's not meat is murder, it's not cow farts are destroying the planet. I mean, and the, not, the one thing I do think is very difficult because a vegan, you know, and, and, I, and I often call this propaganda, but you know, they're very good at visual image and optics and, and a very short, concise message, which is very persuasive. And then you have to spend 20 minutes trying to debunk that, which you always, it's always put you on the back foot. You're always playing defense. And mm -hmm. so I think that's <laughs> something that vegans do very well or, or, and whoever's supporting them or, you know, however, if we want to get conspiratorial about that, but I mean, it's something yeah, sure. that, that we see. Oh, that they're, they're absolutely fantastic at it. I mean, if you look at the Netflix documentaries, and again, you have to ask yourself, why are those documentaries on Netflix in the first place, right? Who has an interest in that? And you look into the numbers of cowspiracy, you see that when cowspiracy came out, I think they claimed CO2 emissions 82% or something on those lines. Later on, they had to come out with a new statement, which was 50% is CO2 emissions from cow burps, right? Not cow farts, but cow burps, allegedly. And now the number is much, much smaller again. So therefore, yeah, you're correct. What they do is they just push out a number, they show you some animal cruelty images, and then you have to defend that position, right? I just want to say something about the health aspect that you mentioned, health, ethics, and environment. You just have to look into the mirror, you said. Yeah, that is true. Because, man, any diet that is messing up body composition should be considered not healthy. Any diet that feeds into fatty tissue and not into muscle tissue should, should at least be questioned. You see that there is something horrendously wrong with the protein pathways. People think nowadays, right, because we have this image from the, the dumb buff guy, the meathead, that is somehow bad to be muscular and that it has nothing to do with health. Yeah, right, but take into consideration that your body needs proteins for all the metabolic pathways, not only for muscle building, but for the regeneration of your skin, of your organs, of your brain as well. All of those mechanisms in the body need protein. So therefore, if you see that you're malnourishing your muscles already, what do you think is happening to the rest of your body internally? But people do not take that into consideration. They want to scream meathead. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a point I've made many times and, you know, I, there's, there's clear evidence that, you know, lean muscle mass is protective from disease and, and also that it, you know, likely leads to longevity, you know, and I think that's, that's interesting. What are, you know, from a health standpoint, what are some of the major sort of fallacies that, that are being sort of put out there by, by, you know, the vegan doctors or <laughs> vegan health advocates that, that you take issue with now that, that, you know, even though you may have put that out there yourself, you know, over the years. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Pretty much all of them, Sean. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I have to laugh, man, but pretty much all of them really starting with the daily dozen of Dr. Gregor with eating three cups of beans per day. Man, if your digestive tract needs three years or something to get adapted to eating beans, sorry, you're not meant to eat beans. Your physiology is not adapted to eat beans if you're farting after one year of eating beans. Something is horribly wrong there, for sure. Beans come with the lectins, the greens come with the oxalates, the salicylates, and whatnot. Every single food item has so many anti-nutrients that will compromise digestion and overall health. So therefore, all of those food items that they are listing, I don't see any particular reason in eating any of those. Sure, maybe some berries or so. Yeah, I think the fruitarians are, have it more right than the actual vegans. All of those health claims are essentially funded on what? You look into every single food item. They're either heavily processed, come with problematic amounts of fiber, problematic amounts of anti-nutrients. So what is healthy about their diet? If you look into the blue zones that have been consuming those particular food groups, all of them have been using those food groups as condiments. If you look into the bean consumption of the Mediterraneans, I have friends from down there. They eat a couple of beans with their fish. Nobody overconsumes or bases their caloric intake on plant foods because once you do that, you're relying on heavily, heavily anti-nutrient rich foods and that will mess up your health in the long run. There was no population that relied only on plant foods, period. So therefore, yeah, go on. Yeah, I mean, one of the uh, popular things is, you know, the Okinawans and the Blue Zones. And, and, and when I look at the data on that, I, real, I found out it was, it was, that data was gathered in 1949 mm -hmm. 
right after World War II when we decimated, when the U.S. decimated Okinawa and we killed off all their damn pigs. Right. So they, went yeah. from, they went from having something like 130,000 pigs on the island to having something like 7,000 or 800, depending on the right. stats you read. And so then, then they had to survive on subsistence foods like, you know, purple sweet potatoes. And so that exactly. became the narrative that all these people live long because they ate these sweet potatoes. And, and that didn't even represent their true diet. But that's been pushed out there for pretty hard. It's insane. 90% of the pig population got decimated. Two years, those people have been eating plant-based, if you will. Those people are sent sanitarians, so that means they are living over 100 years. In a lifespan of 100 years, two years, they've been not even vegan, plant-based, and that somehow is miraculously the reason why they lived up until 100. That is, of course, bullshit. All of those blue zones rely heavily on animal products. Fish is the main thing, and then pork as well. In Okinawa, they even have this saying, in Okinawa, every plate starts with pork and ends with pork, right? Yeah, of course, none of those populations is vegan. None of those populations is classically plant-based either. Have they been eating sweet potatoes? Sure. Is the sweet potato the reason why they lived up until 100? Of course not. People don't take into account that all of those blue zones have a totally different social structure than we do in the West. Those people have a purpose. When they're 70 years old, they still play with their grandchildren. They have a purpose in their society, and that plays a role. Man, if everybody neglects you after you turning 60, you won't have a desire to live. That is a very, very strong psychological aspect that people have to take into consideration. It is not only the diet. Yeah, you touched on it with that, like, that's just one more, like, pillar to health that they have working for them when they have a value to be alive past 60, 70 years old. And then on top of that, add just like, you know, other variables like prioritizing exercise and fitness and things like that. And all of a sudden you start to see them pile up and, and then and then it makes it even more difficult to point to one specific variable as being, being the reason they live to be 100. And uh, for whatever reason, we choose to pick the nutrition part of it, which isn't even entirely accurate. <laughs> no, not at all. Hey, Bobby, you said you spent a lot of time, you know, kind of traveling the world. And, you know, we see different cultures respond differently. I mean, my understanding is, you know, people in Japan, maybe I'm mistaken, they, they kind of don't have any idea about, they're not really into veganism there. They totally think meat is fine. <laughs> Uh, you know, what, what has been your perspective around the world? And we see that, that in many cases, veganism is merely a product of wealthy society that most people in the world, like if you go to some of these really poor countries, I mean, they, they would like no way in hell would be, I'd want to do that. I'm forced to eat this food because I don't have a choice. What is your, what is your perspective around different cultures and regions around the world and how acceptable veganism is to, to those places or if, if you can? No, no, of course. No, veganism is a mainstream push for the masses in the Western society, 100%. It is catered to the overpopulated cities in the West. You've been told everything is overpopulated. We need to be environmentally friendly. We need to eat in a more sustainable way. We need to eat in a more ethical way and such. Meanwhile, the rest of the world, if you go through any culture, you will see that they're heavily, heavily relying on animal products. The Asians, you hear that a lot, they're eating rice, they're basing their diet on rice. Quite the opposite, especially here in Thailand, you can see their traditional dishes. Yes, they do eat rice, but they're eating the whole animal, right? They're eating organs, they have blood soup, they're eating raw meat around here, frogs and whatnot. Basically, they eat every single animal imaginable, right? So therefore, in my travels, I didn't see any push for veganism in those rural areas at all. In the main cities, of course, here in Bangkok, you have vegan restaurants as well, but it's always catered to Westerners. There's always this push for the Westerners, 100%. Yeah, and another thing, again, with this overpopulation I just mentioned here, I've been in Australia, man. You have so much space down there. In Europe, the same. It is only the overpopulated cities where you feel that the world is overpopulated. We have too many. There's not enough resources and such. I believe that this is a brainwashing going on for the masses in those already overpopulated cities because that is not the reality of this planet at all. There's plenty of space. Yeah, that's, that's a very controversial topic because there's people that say that, you know, it's, it's a food distribution problem. It's not a population problem. We had uh, Frank Mitlaner, he's concerned about population growth in, in developing countries and 
really wealth growth because when they decide that they want to consume more, and it's not necessarily food, but when they want to travel, airplane travel, and have uh, you know more and more access to computers and electricity and those types of things, those are going to be the issues with the populations. Maybe not necessarily the food. And right. as you write, there are there are, in the United States there are huge areas, and most of us live. I think eighty percent of the world's population lives in a city and most of it's coastal. And so we've got all this, mm -hmm. this room throughout the world where, you know, pop, humans could live if we chose to do so, but we like to cluster in the nice areas and it's nice to have the nice weather and, and that sort of stuff. And so it's a interesting issue, you know, and, and look, the thing about the, you know, we see that with smoking, you know, when, when, when the West cracked down on smoking in the U S and Europe and that kind of faded a little bit, you know, it just got shifted over to Asia and, and Africa and these poor countries. Mm -hmm. And I think we'll see the same thing with this, you know, plant-based slash processed food. It's just going to be dumped on these poor African developing countries. They don't really have a choice. I mean, they're just like, okay, eat it or eat it or starve. And, and, and uh, you know, I think there's a very different way we could go. I mean, we could teach these people how to farm correctly, how to, how to, how to efficiently raise their animals so they're not all sick. Because it's, it's interesting that I find that, you know, there's 1.4 billion cows on earth, you know, 95 of them are in the U.S., 95 million of them are in the U.S. But, you know, like we look at the Indian herd, which is about 200 million, they're all mm. sick. They're all infested with parasites or sick animals. They're not very productive. Uh, you know, there's just, there's just a lot of waste in that. And, and we can change that and feed a lot more people. And, and I think that's, it's, it's got to be a, you know, willpower thing. You know, and I, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. What we're what we're seeing right now is is all these kids and my kids. I've got I've got a bunch of kids and, and I've got to fight with these kids about, you know, you know, because they they're they're exposed to this plant based stuff all the time at school from their tears from their teachers, um, and and they know. I mean, we talk about this. Yeah, well, animals are going to die anyway, and we and you know, and I and I I'm, I, I don't show, hesitate to show them. Look, there's an animal ate a deer. Are you? Does that bother you? No, that's normal. They they know that's normal. Uh, oh, but, but there's a lot of kids out there where they shelter them from. And it's funny, I get my, in my social media, I had a picture of a lion eating a piece of meat and you couldn't even hardly tell it was from an animal. And that was deemed socially inappropriate. Uh, <laughs> and it was, I had to take it down. Twitter made me take it down. And I, Joe Rogan talked about it on the show. I talked to, you know, I sent Joe a message and he said, mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about it on my show. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just comical. I mean, it's, it's comical, but all at the same time, it's kind of scary that, 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 that these kids are being you know, fed Disney and, you know, and processed food. No, it's absolutely hypocritical. We are, as I said, so disconnected from our food supply. And this is something that they want, apparently, us to get away from. You know, it is displayed as something that has been practiced in ancient times. This is not what civilized society does, right? We transcended that, the need for killing. Yeah, but as I said, you cannot escape that in the end. And meanwhile, we're still eating that food and we are reliant on those companies. So therefore, there is clearly a demand for those products, right? Intuitively, people will always go to those products. But we are slowly transitioning away from that violence, so to speak. They are displaying food as good, violence as bad, and then food stays good, replaced by lab-grown options. And of course, as you said, that is catered to children. But that is very, very dangerous because I always wonder when vegans tell me that the science is out there, cholesterol is bad. How come that mother's milk is cholesterol rich, right? All the building materials are in mother's milk. How does the human body make that shift? When does that happen? And cholesterol becomes something destructive to your body. When do eggs turn into five cigarettes per day? Like what the health claims, right? When is that pathway changing in the human body? I would argue never really, right? Why would dietary cholesterol ever become something bad in your body? Yeah, but either way, yeah, it is, it is absolutely a push, man. It is such a destructive movement. I know I get a little bit dark about it, a bit conspiratorial and whatnot, but if you see what is happening on your own body and with your family, my little sister was vegan, my girlfriend was vegan, my friends were vegan, all of them suffered all the time, man, you know? And if there would be no disclosure for this, they would still be in agony and they wouldn't know why. When you are in that vegan bubble, you do not question anything else, man. You think it is maybe the environment, it's maybe me, it's maybe this, it's maybe that. You cannot find the fault in the vegan diet. And what I'm afraid of is once we only have lab-grown meat, right? I'm going to paint a dark picture here. But once we have only plant-based options, people will feel miserable 
and they will not know how to fix their health because they've never been exposed to animal products. I mean, think about it. We already have allegedly born vegans or born vegetarians. What if we create a society where people grow up without ever really seeing what true health is because they've been indoctrinated and meat is bad, meat is murder, and they've been growing up on those plant-based products. Now they're facing ill health and the only way out of it would be to take pharmaceutical drugs. The last year of veganism, I was really considering taking antidepressants because I was convinced I'm just depressed. It's normal. Yeah, great. After a couple of eggs, I wasn't depressed anymore. There was the fix, right? It's crazy, man. This is what they're doing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's sad and it's not unique to veganism. I, I think, you know, we, we have kids growing up on the standard American garbage diet. They start out sure. obese and hyper, you know, hyperinsulinemic and, and, and they've got chronic disease from day one, literally. I mean, they're in utero. They're exposed to that. And so I think there's a lot of problems all around. And we do f- find people that never in their entire life have they experienced a day of being healthy. And we've got, we've now got generations that have done that. And so, so many people are, you know, they're just, they just don't like their body. They don't like the way they feel. They, they abandon the physical part and they get sucked into video games or they get sucked into virtual reality and that's becomes their world. And, and that's, you know, you know, are we going to be the singularity where we're going to be transhumans and we're going to implant chips in our brain and we're all going to be, you know, these, these sort of, you know, Wally people that ride around in carts and you know <laughs> suck down soy slop and synthetic meat and, and and that is our existence. We have a gelatinous frame, you mm-hmm. know, kind of like a you know, <laughs> I say a boneless chicken, but I mean we're we're basically <laughs> not doing much physically and we're just we're just kind of living in this virtual world. I mean that that to me, I mean that, that seems dystopian and dark and but I think there's we're already starting to see that a little bit. You know, we we we, we it's not too hard to make that leap. Yeah, exactly. I don't know if it seems dystopian or dark or just a natural or an artificially created progression of what is going on right now. I honestly do not see another option for the future. Again, sounds dark, yes, but what else is the option, you know? As for right now, everything that we are focused on is technology and it is basically so alluring to us that we cannot step away from it. Right now, as I said, we're using this technology. If I would tell my friends, hey, I have a new phone, everybody would like to check it out. Hey, I have a new car. Everything is technology. We are attracted to technology. It is inescapable. Is there an artificial push behind it that is luring us into something that has an agenda behind it? Yeah, highly likely, right? But where is this going? I believe that there is, as for right now, no option to turn our backs on what we created. You can say that we essentially summoned a demon here with technology and that we definitely could end up in this singularity because if you have so much physical issues where would you rather spend your time in the virtual reality or outside right outside you're fat yeah you have no girls you're a loser in the virtual reality you have it all right one click away you can get anything you need you have a six pack and 10 ladies just worshiping you everybody would trade that off right or oh, many people will trade that off, I have to say. So therefore, I definitely see that this way it's going. Bobby, let me ask you, because you are, I mean, among the, the vegans that I have seen, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm relatively new to this, but I mean, there's, a, there's, there's quite a few recently that have mm. uh, sort of renounced veganism. And come, but you, you've certainly been one of the more outspoken ones uh, mm. and still putting out content and, and really sort of railing against veganism or other ones are just kind of like apologizing and saying, well, I may go back to yeah. veganism. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I really, mm. I really want to be a vegan, but my health won't allow it. And you're not doing that. You're saying, screw no. this. It's a stupid idea. It's a bad idea. It's going to ruin your health. Have you gotten a lot of backlash from being, from being that particular guy? Uh, and, and you know, what, what's been the impact on you since you, since you, you know, kind of turned around? Oh yeah, sure. Death threats. <laughs> really i got death threats i get messages on a daily basis from vegans telling me that they're gonna find me somewhere i'm gonna hit me and whatever they're gonna smash my face in i got just a message a couple of hours ago that was funny yeah sure i get a lot of backlash but again it is important to not be apologetical about this at all you know, once you see the detrimental health effects from this diet, you have to speak out. This is your responsibility. As I said before, many people, they just step away. They don't talk about this. 
this is crucial. I mean, you see it as well, Sean, right? You could just eat meat, be happy, and don't talk about anything else, right? But you see exactly there is a mainstream push behind it, and this needs to be disclosed. So therefore, yes, I'm getting death threats. Yes, I'm getting all kinds of threats on a daily basis. People are giving me hate. They say that I'm a shill for the meat and dairy industry, that I'm getting funded. I'm getting sponsored even. <laughs> uh, on that note, I would love to get sponsored, right? That would be amazing. It would make my life so much easier. Aside from that, I do not care about those people. When I see people stepping out nowadays, you just saw it with Raw Vana. She stepped out and she's like, oh, sorry, guys. You know, I had to do this. But in reality, I would like to be vegan. But somehow I have to eat fish. What are you apologizing for? You found something that restored your health. That is great. Shouldn't you share that with your fellow people? Shouldn't you tell them, hey, listen, if you eat fish, you're actually healthier than if you eat just raw vegetables. Wow, big surprise. You should share that. I see that as an obligation, and therefore I will not shut up about this. In the beginning, I said, I don't want to hate on veganism. But honestly, Sean, after the reintroduction, every single animal product has a certain benefit. The eggs fixed my digestion. The meat gave me more energy. The fish gave me better libido. Everything has its place. If you start excluding those food groups, you will suffer. And I am not going to shut up about it. No chance. I hate when I see people suppressing that and trying to appeal to the plant-based viewers. Why would you, man? Now they're playing, you know, both sides. Yeah, I like the vegan still. Here I'm eating 80% plant-based. I'm just doing it for health. A little bit of meat here. You know, trying to be between no 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 no. be honest about what you're doing it's not the plans that fix you it's the animal product speak out it's your obligation well yeah, said I mean, yeah i think that's great bobby i mean there's and then and then of course we see the what's his name goji man saying that you know wasn't the plants <laughs> that messed you up you were you were sick before and animal products are not going to fix you it's it's you know you've got to you've got to do some special uh, you know, stool test that only I can interpret. <laughs> Send me your poop now. <laughs> yeah, I see that stuff, and it just, I just kind of laugh about that. But I mean, there, there is definitely a, you know, it, it's, it's almost. Again, I hate to be in this drama, but I mean, all I see all day long, you know, because I, you know, I, I have a YouTube channel. I look at what's in there, and it's always my response to someone else leaving veganism. It's like that's all that's going on now. It's just. People yeah. leaving and people commenting on their leaving, and it's it, it's it's a it's a big drama pageant where you know sure. you know response response, and that's I guess that's the nature of YouTube. But I mean, in the end, you know, I'm wondering if it's going to advance our knowledge. Is it going to is it going to help people? Uh, you know, it's 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 just sort of interesting to observe this, and I try, you know, not to get too too caught up in that stuff because I'm just trying to out here, just trying to trying to tell people to do what works, and I don't care what diet you're on. I mean, I, I happen to do this, and I think there's some benefits to it, but in the end, you know, it's like, I'm not trying to save the tomatoes. I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not out here to, 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 uh, you know, have an ethical argument. And I know that's, you know, part of that ideology, but, uh, you know, that's just kind of what I see. Yeah. With the responses you have to take into account, of course, it's drama. Of course, it can get boring for people that are looking for a little bit more intellectual stimulation on YouTube, but it reaches a lot of people. You know, every time you respond to a big YouTuber, of course, you will reach more people. And with that, you can really provoke change in those people's minds, right? Therefore, I see that as a valuable tool. I find it a bit boring and tiresome as well. But every time I do a response to somebody, you just see more clicks. And this is how it works. You don't reach people by appealing to everybody and not cross-collaborating, so to speak. It is a tool in the toolbox, and we have to use it to promote a healthy message here. With the vegan diet, one more thing, because you mentioned Goji Man there. People always say that somehow you're masking your underlying issues, right? Meat didn't fix you, but you're just masking the issues. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? So they say that with fasting, raw veganism, you messed up your body. And now you reintroduced meat and you're masking the symptoms. Meanwhile, the whole food plant-based diet doesn't fix the issue, right? You need to step onto the SIBO diet. You need to take antibiotics. You need to do another fast. I have a question for the vegans. Why does the whole food plant-based diet does not fix the gut issues, right? And why does the meat-based diet fix the gut issues? They will always claim that you're just masking symptoms. 
those issues have not been resolved. What issues? An allergic reaction to anti-nutrients in foods? What issues? That is not an issue. That is your human physiology not being adapted to those foods. 90% of SIBO cases, people that have SIBO relapse again on a whole food plant-based diet because they're just not adapted to those foods. That's what I see with those people. And now you can send as much poop as you wanted to Goji Man. He won't fix the issue. I don't understand how people like him became an authority on the internet. He's just a student. He's just a student, man. You know, sorry. He's sitting there in his basement collecting poop and sending you <laughs> pills and SIBO, yes, sorry, and SIBO tests, and somehow this will magically fix you. That is bullshit, and everybody knows it. Meanwhile, the carnivore diet is fixing people because it is addressing the issue of those plants that are not digestible for you. It's that simple, but they somehow do not see it. They will try every single measurement to get adapted to an artificially created food group that we haven't been evolved to eat in the first place. It has nothing to do with masking the symptoms. You're just eating what your body is adapted to eat, plain and simple. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get you to, I'm trying to think of where you could say something positive about veganism, but I, I suspect you're probably not going to say much at this point. I mean, you know, like I said, I have, and this is kind of interesting because I've, I've known many vegetarian vegans in my life and they've all been wonderful people that I've actually interacted with. But, you, you know, then the online persona becomes a different thing. It's, it's a lot sure. of name calling and threatening and, and all this stuff. And so, um, you know, what, if, if, if you could say, I'm going to still be vegan and it didn't mess up your health, how would you do things differently? I mean, I mean, you know, just, just as far as acting attitude, uh, how would you, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what, you know, like I said, is there a better way to, 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 to do it? Because we see, I mean, I guess I'm exposed to the silliness, the worst of the worst, the activism, which right. I disagree with. Um, but, but I suppose that, you know, again, I don't know. I'm not in that community. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure I walk around and see vegans and never say anything to me. I've never, you know, uh, I, I think I've been eyeballed a few times at the grocery store when if I've gone, been to Whole Foods and I see somebody looking at me funny that I think doesn't have any meat in their cart. I always got to worry that I'm going to get stabbed or something like that. But, but I, no, 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 Sean, they're, the com hunters. they're compassionate. They're the compassionate and loving. Vegan. They would never like <laughs> Well, that's good. I feel better now because I, I kind of, I just kind of, you know, when I'm walking through the produce section, I guys kind of, Kind of look at my make sure my peripheral vision is working pretty good. So if it's a meat counter, and I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm okay. Typically, you're safe there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah about doing things differently, hmm, it's really hard to say. First and foremost, I can say with certainty that I would never go vegan again, never in my life, and I do not recommend it to anybody, anybody ever. That is something that I really have to say. Other than that, I see the biggest danger in spreading that plant-based health information if you look into those pillars as you said health environment and ethics if you want to talk about the ethics if you want to be an animal rights activist and you acknowledge that you're compromising your health for the greater good of the animals you become a jesus figure a gandhi figure then all good go for it be that guy no worries but the moment that you mix in health then we have a problem because it has nothing to do with a healthy diet, not at all. If you look again into those plant-based studies, the plant-based populations, there always was an amount of animal products. You have to mention that. If you want to promote veganism, you have to promote it either from an ethical standpoint or just from an anecdotal standpoint, you feel good and that's about it. You cannot claim that you have the secret to longevity and health here with veganism because this is when it becomes destructive. So if I would do it again, which I would never do, then I would say that, yeah, be ethical and kind and take into account that your health will suffer, which on its own is a contradiction because how is it ethical to be unhealthy, right? If you have a society of weak, malnourished vegans, how is that ethical? Yeah, you create a dangerous society of yeah. release. We hear, uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting, I'm going to paleo, I've been talking at paleo effects this year uh, in, in April, and I'm on a panel, and, and Dr. Joe Kahn will be on the panel, and so I'm sure oh. we'll go back and forth about some stuff, but what he likes to say is it's the only diet that's ever been approved or proven to reverse heart disease, and we just had mm -hmm. a couple of cardiologists on today that did not agree with that particular <laughs> statement. But what, what is, I mean, you've heard that. I'm sure you maybe even use sure. that. What are your thoughts on, on the Caldwell Esselstyn or the Dean Ornish 
Sure, sure. Plant-based diet reverses heart disease. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, of course. Again, as I said, Dean Ornish, Esselstyn, there was a percentage of animal products in their diet recommendations, especially low-fat dairy. So first and foremost, it's not vegan, right? We should end it there. It's not vegan. Done. Secondly, okay, even if they reversed heart disease with a dietary approach, then that happened due to a fasting mimicking state. You essentially have stages of fasting, the most radical one being dry fasting, then progressing to water fasting, juice fasting, fruit fasting, raw veganism, and then basically a plant-based diet. That is a fasting mimicking state. If you temporarily fasted your body out and you got a benefit out of that, you reversed heart disease, if that is true, is another topic. But then you had a short-term intervention that has been successful. Congratulations. Amazing. But is that something that you can practice long-term? It doesn't say anything about it. You see Dr. Gregor saying that exact same thing. He says, if we have one diet that reverses heart disease, shouldn't that be our default diet? Yeah, probably not because it's a short-term intervention. If I heal something with a water fast, should that be my default diet? No, it's a water fast, right? I wouldn't do that for the rest of my life. This is how I see those interventions. Yeah, I mean, the other, the other criticism is it wasn't just diet. It was you know, stop smoking, stop drinking, exercise, meditation, and the right. actual full lifestyle switch. And the actual uh, thing that they measured has extremely variable uh, reliability. And so that, that was a criticism we heard from the cardiologist today. So I think it's just, you know interesting that, that you know, we, we, I, I see this all the time. And, you know, when people and, and I, I've, I've gotten to where I, I used to sort of try to reason with people on a vegan diet and I would talk, try to try to present, present evidence and why I thought what they were saying was wrong. And I just, at this point, I just don't even engage. Half the time I just stop talking. Sometimes I block them if they're particularly, you know, nasty and, or, or sometimes it's a source of, you know, some, you know, and, and your point about, I call it education, you know, edu- edutainment, you know, you've got to entertain people to get them mm-hmm. to listen to you and then you can, then you can use, you can drop some knowledge. So I, I sometimes use some of these kind of crazy vegan stories or, 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 or responses. And I just, I just kind of use them as a source of humor and it just kind of, it kind of riles people up. And then we, then we have more people that are listening to you. And I guess it's the same thing as these response videos, I suppose. People on YouTube want to be entertained. Nobody wants to go to school again, right? You want entertainment and therefore this is definitely the way to go. Yes, it's clickbaity. Yes, people will complain. Oh my God, you just do that for the clicks. Yeah, guess what? That is YouTube. Of course you do it for the clicks, so to speak. You want that information to get exposure. If that is the way to go, of course, humor will always go a long way. Triggering people, it is just a very effective method method to do things. This is how it works. And to reason and argue with vegans, uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense because they're too indoctrinated. It is essentially like talking to a religious person. Good luck in convincing a fundamentalist Christian that God does not exist. It's impossible, of course. You know, if you have strong beliefs, you cannot argue about it. The, the lack of rationality and objectivity is something that is really, really predominant in the vegan community. I saw it as well. And I have to say that When I was a vegan, which is so strange, man, because I always kept an open mind, I thought when I was a vegan, I didn't see it as a possibility to talk to the meat camp, right? I know you talked to Tristan. Back in the day, it felt like the opposition, the enemy. We do not talk to those people, right? Because somehow we, yeah, we just saw them as the enemy, as the threat. As vegans, you stay in your bubble where you reaffirm your own beliefs and you repeat the same narrative over and over and over again. This is why they say that veganism is a cult. Rightfully so. You know, I, I, the litmus test for me was when I would get in one of these conversations, I would just ask the person, I said, if your health depended upon you eating an animal product, would you do it? Mm. And most times they would say, no, I would never do that, even if my health failed. And then I, then I just said, okay, then there's nothing more to discuss. I mean, you're not a rational right. person. Well, and yeah, then you're exactly. operating from two different principles at that point, because you're going to eat what makes you optimized and healthy. And if they're not going to, then that's where those roads complete, completely merge in separate ways at that point. Sure, sure. But the thing is this, I'm going to say that if you claim that you wouldn't eat animal products, if your health depended on it, yeah, then I'm going to say that you didn't experience bad health yet. Because sooner or later, it's going to hit you, man. Sooner or later, the deficiencies will be so great 
that you cannot take it anymore. And then you will sing a completely different song. I see that with many vegans, me, myself as well. When everything was fine, I said the same. Nah, I would never eat an animal. You don't have to. Because subconsciously, you still believe, right, that there is no way in hell that you would need animal products. The narrative in the vegan community is you don't need them, period. That's it, right? There's always a plant-based solution, they say. This is why those people claim that they would never touch animal products. But once their health is sacrificed, and I don't wish that upon anybody, I lost a tooth, goddammit, you know, for what exactly? For being on a plant-based diet, lost a tooth, deteriorated mentally. I just wasted basically two years of my life, muscle torn, ATL torn, from doing nothing. I went for a little jog. I tore my knee apart. I lifted a two and a half kilogram dumbbell to warm up and my biceps tore apart. Complete, dis yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not, not a heavy lift, not a PR here. Two and a half <laughs> kilos just to warm up, boom, my biceps blew out. So those are damages that I will have for the rest of my life now, right? And all of that got repaired straight away. I had cramps every single day. I was cramping. And yes, I know about magnesium, dear vegans. I tried it all, right? Magnesium, electrolytes, whatever. It didn't help. Just a couple of eggs and fish later and everything came back to normal. So therefore, those people that claim they would never touch animal products because... Because what? You didn't experience bad health yet. And I don't wish it upon you. But once you do, you will be another ex-vegan. And this is what I have to say. Every single now vegan is a future ex-vegan. We have a dropout rate of 90% anyways. All of those people that claim veganism is the way to go will be future ex-vegans. And therefore, we have to handle them with care, with love, and with respect. Because none of them will stay in that camp. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a good message too, just in general. And I think, you know, that's one thing I'll, every once in a while I'll get a message from someone who's, you know, angry about promoting eating meat and stuff. And, you know, one of the things I'll respond by is I'll just say, because, you know, usually they're coming in angry and I'll, I'll say, well, if, if your diet is, you know, healthy and, and, and good for you, then your, your attitude shouldn't be the first thing I'm going to do with this person I've never met before is send them an email <laughs> in a fit of rage. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I think you have to consider that too. Like if, when, when any, anytime someone does something negative to you like that too, is just ask like, well, what's driving this. And in some cases it's like, that's probably not what their actual personality really is. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, it's the indoctrination paired with a nutritional deficiency. Honestly, this is really what is going on. You need B vitamins, you need DHA, EPA to have a functioning brain and to have a positive mental attitude. I saw that straight away. I mean, my depression cleared up after a couple of eggs. It's that simple. People see that. And therefore, if you stay in a state of depression and you pair that with ideological indoctrination, of course, you will spoon negativity all across the internet. With that being said, the internet, the comment section, back in the day, we had television and nobody had the chance to write a comment, right? It was just thoughts. I remember my father, we were watching Mike Tyson boxing. And my father would scream, oh, you idiot. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, say that to Mike Tyson's face. You know, what are you doing there? It was just a thought, right? Nowadays, you have the option to just write down a comment, right? You idiot, you, whatever, you do it wrong, meat eater. You can do that straight away. And this is why we are facing so much negativity nowadays. You have to take into account that just this temporary impulse that people share with you, right? For what it's worth. Yeah. I think that may be a, a pretty good sentiment to, to, to finish up on. Yeah. I'm going to go <laughs> see my son. So anyway, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are really going to benefit from this uh, and, and what you're doing in general. I'm, I'm looking forward to see what happens if you can get that documentary going. And, and uh, because I think, it, I, you know, I think there has to be a counter message. And, and you know, as much as, you know, I, I had no desire to be the meat guy, but it's just sort of evolved that way. And, and, mm -hmm. and you know, I just, I just kind of feel that it's my duty now to try to help in any way I can and learn as much about the environment and the ethical side and, and talking to pe people like you helps us to further understand what's, what's going on. Because I, and I know, and I think there should be more discourse between people that eat meat and, and, and vegans and, and kind of come to, to a, it's not a heat, you know, it's not a, I mean, in the end, cause I, and I, and as much as I give Joel kind of hard time, I mean, I think we're, we both generally want the same thing as people to be healthier. Now, 
I disagree with his nutritional strategy. I think mm -hmm. we both agree that processed food and, and some of this stuff is garbage. And, and we agree that we should exercise and not smoke. And there's a lot of commonalities there, but we just disagree about probably the ethical argument about animals and, and, and some of the health issues. But, uh, but, I, but I think hopefully more of that will happen where we've got people that were ex-vegans now that they can talk with vegans or even people like me that never were vegans or never wanted to be vegans, but at the same time want the best for people, you know, from their health standpoint. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's important that we open up the discussion on that note for the first time, me and John Venus, we're going to have a podcast together. That's the first time as well that an actual still vegan and a non-vegan communicate in that fashion. So that's definitely a step into the right direction. I want to thank you not only for having me on, Sean, but for doing what you're doing. It's absolutely amazing. As I said, from the vegan perspective, back in the day, I thought you're absolutely crazy. How can <laughs> that be? How Really, I thought it's absolutely the the craziest idea on this planet to just eat meat. What's wrong with those guys? But now looking into it, I have to say that you played a big role and other people like yourself that are speaking out for this are playing a humongous role in this shift in the recovery of vegans and in the shift of the global narratives. Therefore, I really believe we're doing God's work here. It's really, really needed in those times. Otherwise, we are facing all of those dark topics that we were discussing today. So therefore, the discussion is... Absolutely on right now. You're doing great work. So thank you very much for doing what you're doing. No, well, thank you very much. Yeah, it, like it's, it's 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 a long fight. I mean, it's going to be yeah, it's, it's going to take some time in the making. But, but anyway, I think we all you know come together, and I think we just do what's right for people. Anyway, That's guys, awesome. Zach, awesome. I gotta get, I gotta get man. Cool. Yeah, Bobby, do you have anything you want to share? YouTube channel, social media links, or anything like that before you leave? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, just head over to Bobby's Perspective on YouTube. From there, you can find the Instagram, the Facebook, and whatnot. So Bobby's Perspective on YouTube is basically the go-to. Perfect. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, I watch those videos every once in a while. They're, they're great, and I really enjoy it. And like I said, I, that's the reason I ran into figured out who you were when you, when you're kind of beating up on Garth Davis. Which <laughs> so, anyway, you guys check it out. That'd be great. All right. All right, guys. Thanks, I, gotta, cool. I, gotta, I gotta run, Zach. All right. All the best. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.